Welcome back to my second part of looking back at how Mists of Pandaria changed World of Warcraft as a whole. There is a part one which covers a bunch of important subjects I'll skip out here, I'd give that a look through first, I'll link it below. Let's get straight back into it by looking at the PvE scene. Following Cataclysm, dungeons were retuned down once again to the point where you could just fly through them. It is kind of a shame though, as Mr. Pandaria dungeons do overall feel quite forgettable, and often were more tools used for storytelling over anything else. I remember most of them either had backtracking, cutscenes, elevators, or RP events as well. Stuff that makes you wait, basically. And whilst they look great, I don't really think they did overall too much for the expansion. There was also the revamped Scholomance, Scarlet Monastery, and Scarlet Hall which I remember being a bit more of a challenge, but still nothing too serious, more just reworking these old dungeons into the modern game, with heroic versions at level cap for a bit of extra gear and content. And don't worry, I'm not forgetting about challenge modes, we're just saving them for later. As for raiding, it was a bit of a roller coaster overall. Tier 14 was Mogashin Vaults, Terrace of Endless Springs, and Heart of Fear. Each of these opening raids were quite short in size, being either four or six bosses long. And whilst they certainly had some interesting and unique fights like Spirit Kings, Elagon, Garalon, and Lei Shi, it did feel like quite a short tier all the same. Personally, I think it's been one of the weaker opening tiers we have received at the start of an expansion. Don't get me wrong, the zones the raids took place in were pretty awesome, varied, and the bosses had some mechanics that we haven't ever seen again, but it's just not too memorable as a tier. The next tier, though, would certainly change that. Tier 15 was the Throne of Thunder, to this day one of the most well regarded raids Blizzard has ever put together. In fact, I think most people would put Throne of Thunder up there with Ulduar in terms of content. First of all, the raid itself was massive and had up to 13 bosses, and was full of amazing fights. The Council of Tribes with Horridon, all the way inside to G Come, where you had to fly about onto the different platforms, Darumu the Observer, the LFR Destroyer, Dark Animus with its unique anima mechanic, the Twin Consorts, which I remember being one of the the easiest penultimate bosses ever, and finally Lei Shen, the Thunder King himself. A very memorable multi-phase fight, visually looked good, had decision making on the fight as well, as many different interesting mechanics, adds, knockbacks, one-shots, raid positioning requirements, everything you would expect from an M boss. Lei Shen ended up living for 14 days from release overall, a method took world first in this tier, and would go on to start the run of success from tier to tier from this point onwards. There was also the final hidden boss who was Raden. Unfortunately though, he ended up being quite undertuned since he just wasn't adequately tested so he could remain a surprise. So we got in Cataclysm from a boss that was buggy and just didn't function correctly in Sinestra to one that was too easy. This has always been the problem with hidden bosses. Finally, we ended up with Siege of Orgrimmar, a massive 14 boss raid and the culmination of the expansion's build up to finally assaulting Orgrimmar to depose Garrosh, who had been on a tear across the continent for some time now. Once again, I have to say this raid was overall very solid. It had a largely decent difficulty curve with a sharp incline at Black Fuse and onwards. 14 bosses would certainly keep players busy for some time. This raid also had many memorable fights. The Iron Juggernaut, Dark Shaman needing three tanks on Heroic, taking down General Nazgrim, Gammon taking his revenge for all those years of being bullied in Orgrimmar, Thok the Bloodthirsty, the Dinosaur Boss, and finally the ending three bosses, Blackviews with a weird and wonderful conveyor belt, Paragons of the Klaxi, a boss that changed rotation weekly, and Garrosh himself, a colossal seven phase marathon of a fight. The world first kill being just over 15 minutes long, once again by method, saved by a clutch paladin bubble at the last second. And I touched on it in part one, but classes were just so good here. Druids had explosive mushrooms, warlocks metamorphosis, disc priests could blanket entire raids. It was just a great time to be raiding at the top end in World of Warcraft. Go back and watch any of the world first kill from methods from Mr. Pandaria, and they're joking about like it's nothing until it starts getting serious on the fight. If Shadowlands can bring us back to this, that would be amazing. Speaking about about raiding, 5.4 and Siege of Orgrimmar also brought out the flexible difficulty for LFR and Normal, where the raid would scale to the number of players that you brought along, and this was the final raid to work like this, as the top end of raiding would change forever in Worlds of Draenor with the introduction of 20-man mythic raids. Moving on from raids, Blizzard aimed to expand the endgame content in Mists of Pandaria beyond just PvP and PvE. They felt as though in the past few expansions, players have been spending far too much time 
sitting about in their respective capitals, though many, many new gameplay mechanics were added. Mr. Pandario had the first season of challenge mode for dungeons. This could almost be seen as an early version of Mythic Plus, where player gear was scaled down to all be an equal level, and dungeons had gold, silver, and bronze medal system in place, and gold, and you got yourself some really cool looking armor and weapon transmogs. There was a massive emphasis in expanding collections as a real end game form of content in MOP. There was a metric ton of new toys, gadgets, rare items that you could get from a wide variety of rare mobs out in the open world, changing your appearance, taunting mobs, summoning pets. I remember the meteor toy on the Timeless Isle was one of my favourites ever to get. It circumvented the lack of flying there so well. Speaking of pets, we also got pet battles. The vast majority of companion pets were redesigned to be able to battle with stats, abilities and so on, and there were hundreds to collect with different rarities, stat templates, as well as trainers out in the open world that you could take on for achievements or token rewards. Oh, and there was also PvP pet battles, let's not forget about that. Honestly, I quite liked it as a concept, and I remember making so much gold leveling and reselling pets after doing two pet daily runs through all trainers in Pandaria. I must have done that run around hundreds of times. Another effort to get players out into the open world were world bosses, each new patch of bringing something big and mean into the world. These were the equivalents of Wintergrasp in Wrath or Tolbarad in Cataclysm, just loop in the art of bosses really. Still, them being in the open world made world PvP much more of a thing at times during Pandaria. On top of this, they all dropped mounts maybe somewhat cruelly for collectors, as to this day they are still so rare. I remember getting them out from the Shah during a run in Mists of Pandaria on my lock, and I didn't realise how lucky I was for some time either. And on top of the new dungeon content, we also had scenarios. These were a new type of content that only took place in Mists of Pandaria. These were three man events with no roll queue, pretty much designed to tell a story. Blizzard envisioned them as PvE battlegrounds, and there were somewhat amazingly 15 of them in total. These actually told some big lore moments, the attempt on Vol'jin's life, the destruction of Theramore, and the unearthing of the Heart of Usage, for example. And Blizzard saw them as pretty popular, or at least their stats must have told them that, because they gave loads of Valor points. I remember more or less only ever doing battle on the high seas, as it took about 5 or 10 minutes and you were done for the day. And just to rattle off a few more features, there's really so much stuff in Mr. Pandaria. We got loot spec in 5.3, Bling Trung made his first appearance from engineering, Professions got way more mounts and pets added to them. Cooking got loads of sub-professions for each stat from Harfill Valley and Valley of the Four Winds. Don't forget about the player farms and the best friend system with NPCs there. The Black Market Auction House at the Veiled Stir selling legacy items from removed content like Tier 3 from Vanilla Nax. We got the Brawl Pub or Brawl Gar Arena. Loads of unique encounters in a 1v1 arena. Best of all, you always had a crowd so people could laugh at your misfortune if you failed. There were literally dozens of bosses, four per rank, nine ranks overall, not including rare bosses, and some of them were really challenging at the time and tuned to be very close with current gear, but much easier later on. Bosses like Battletron were a nightmare for most casters, GG Engineering, Dark Summoner, Epic Maximus, Ahuru, and especially Hexos. And for some reason, every time the Brawl Arena has been brought back in following expansions, it's always been laughably easy for anyone in remotely any decent gear, and it's a real shame because solo challenge content like this is something so many people can get into and actively improve themselves as a player. PvP was also changed up quite a bit in MOP from Kata, giving players baseline resilience at around 30% as well as having PvP power on. These changes were aimed at just stopping insane bursts taking place, but at the same time made some classes that were already extremely difficult to kill even harder. We got two new battlegrounds themed around new objectives, the Silver Shard Mines, as well as the Temple of Kotmogu. We also had two new arenas, since we had no new ones in Cataclysm, those being Tolveron Arena and Tiger's Peak. Other than this, PvP was largely much as it had been for quite a while, and this was the point in time where I personally started taking more of an interest in the PvE rather than the PvP scene. In fact, I think I didn't even know the Silver Shard Mines existed until I had to go there as part of the quest for the Legendary Cloak. Which brings me to the next point, to Legendaries in Mists of Pandaria. There were actually a few of them, some of which you may have forgotten about. 
The goal in Mr. Pandaria was simply to allow every player to experience a legendary questline and their power. For far too long they had just been for a few select players, in MOP we had legendaries for everyone. It was a massive questline every single player could have gone through. At the start we had the legendary gems that were just plus 500 stat gems you could use on shard touch weapons from various bosses. The second reward was an item that added a further socket to a shard touch weapon. The next reward was even more powerful being the legendary meta gems. By now these were starting to have some seriously powerful effects and I really forgot just how good these were looking back. Last of all and the part that was most memorable for Mop was the journey to get the cloak. This was really the same deal as we'd seen for legendaries in previous expansions being a huge quest chain just as we had with the likes of Shadow Morn, Tarek Gosa and Fangs of the Father. But this time they were for everyone and they had some really nice effects like cheating death or providing benefits for overhealing. You could also buy off spec cloaks once you completed the quest line for 10k gold as well, giving us a bit of a gold sink at the same time. All in all I think many players appreciated the chance to get their hands on the legendary for the first time, but it undoubtedly wasn't quite as special since if everyone gets it, it's something that's just par for course, it becomes expected. It was another look into solving the problem of how legendaries should be done, and by this point it was looking as though there's no real right answer to this question, and we will come to see in time the exact same rollout of legendaries in Warlords of Draenor, but we'll talk about that more when we get there. On top of all the other open world activities, dailies and Mists of Pandaria were given a bit more importance. Early on for okay items, later on for very good enchants, inscription recipes were often locked behind them. And don't forget the mounts, toys and pets of course, as had become commonplace by now, and there were many many reputations introduced throughout the duration of MOP. They were also quite grindy to complete and tick off that perfect looking 999 out of a thousand exalted rep list some players have been maintaining for several expansions. In time to come though, perhaps it would have been for the best to keep there being more content rather than cutting it back. I think above all, what has sold so many people on a good memory of Mists of Pandaria was the class design back then, how they felt, played, the customization through new talents and rotations. It just goes to show how absolutely core good class design is in this game. People will happily overlook issues if the buttons they press make them feel good about what they're doing. But like every expansion, Mists wasn't without its criticisms for sure, so what were they? Let's add to that legendary point first of all, it was basically a requirement in order to raid, especially heroic raiding, and added another layer on top of the achievements and item levels. And you could say you should have it anyway if you played the expansion, but that's the thing, people take breaks. Mandatory grinds that give massive power gains have proven to be problematic, don't think so? How about essences or corruption in BFA at the moment? Sure, the cloaks weren't on the same power level, but for the time it caused exactly the same problems for returning players. Pandaren themselves. We started off talking about them in part 1, time for a few more words on them now. Blizzard thought they were more popular than they were. Players didn't overly like them at all. How many of you have a Pandaren beyond just a monk? I know I made one, but I ended up race changing it eventually when leveling as I just got, got fed up of looking at it and I've never done that with another race I've been leveling. Even looking at the Pandaren Death Knights now in retail is just kind of weird to see. They're a hard sell back in MOP and haven't really grown all that much in time. In fact, Looking at the stats, Pandaren make up about 2% of the player base for each faction, and I find that number kind of believable considering how often you see them compared to orcs, humans or elves. Remember something else that came with Throne of Thunder? Thunderforging. The first iteration of randomly gained power on gear to come into the game. Now the idea behind this was basically to incentivize some interest in loot from reclears, because after you complete your tier there isn't that much to look forwards to apart from weapons and trinkets, and saying this, Thunderforged items were only 6 item levels higher than their normal or heroic counterparts, so it wasn't really a big deal back then compared to what we have nowadays, where items can vary massively through titan forging or corruption. Either way, I'm going to put this in the more negative area of the video since I feel it could have been seen as the start of random power, despite it not being over the top in Mists of Pandaria, and generally seen as an okay addition to reclears. Maybe Titan Forging should have been just kept at this moving forwards and never really changed. Siege of Orgrimmar released on the 10th of September 2013. Warlords of Draenor launch wasn't till the 13th of November 2014. One raid for over a year. 14 months of no new content. Just when you thought Blizzard couldn't possibly outdo the expansion release cycle from Cat to Mop, we had this. All the same, 14 months is a massive amount of time. Surely Blizzard were able to make good use of this time and put together a great expansion. Well, I think we'll have to leave that for next time as we check out how did Warlords of Draenor change World of Warcraft?
If you like what you see, give the video a like and subscribe as there's plenty more to come. As always, thank you all so much for watching. Take care. Bye.